uh, test results came out as a result of or to prove other theories, correct? Like certain uh, experiments were basically done in order to prove another theory, basically saying that parallax and these kind of things uh, could have been done just to prove relativity. No, or, I never said that parallax was used. No, to no, no, prove I'm rel- saying that. I'm saying that. Oh, okay. Well, see, now here's a little problem that I think comes up in discussions of this nature. And that is when a person finds that the truth he once believed is true is now false, and he attributes that to a conspiracy by those who have taught this falsehood as to why he had believed this falsehood before, the tendency is for that person to consider everything that he sees to be a conspiracy. Now that mentality is just as dangerous as the people who have made the conspiracies and have foisted upon us as uh, as a truth and it actually is a falsehood. So we got two extremes here uh, and we have to be careful in my opinion not to go to the other extreme to make everything that we see a conspiracy theory. Well, it's more of a, and I believe that you should go back and readdress everything, especially from that that area of science. Um, meaning that if they are uh, allowing some things to get through the scientific method, and things are being taught in schools that you and I will both believe uh, they're doing for a sinister reason, uh, to then just give them carte blanche on the rest of it, I think is outrageous. And so when we to bring everything back that's when it starts to open up some of these uh, other mentalities to where we see it, uh, it looks like it's more of a direct uh, FU, basically, to the creator. In, it in could be. Yeah, it could be, but I want to say this, though. For the geocentrists, it doesn't make any difference whether we have a small universe or a large universe. The Earth is in the center and doesn't move in either of those universes. But for the uh, for those who don't believe that the Earth is a globe, they only have one choice, and that's a very, very small universe, you see. So mm-hmm. they kind of box themselves in in that sense, because if they can't prove that the universe is small based on the verified scientific uh, method that we have used as in stellar parallax. Uh, what about the verified the scientific method that says that the Earth is spinning? Why would you be okay with saying that's not um, true, but other things that they say? I mean, I, I'm guessing that you haven't actually done these parallax tests yourself, meaning you've taken the word of cosmologists at, at you know, at face value, but then other things you have decided not to take. So I guess that's my question is, for me, since I couldn't make those decisions, I had to come back and say, let me reevaluate it all. And when I did that... What I did with stellar parallax is there are two possibilities to stellar parallax, the heliocentric model and the geocentric model. So there was no escaping the issue there. You have to answer stellar parallax you have two choices. Which one are you going to choose? You can choose either one. Modern science allows us to do that, and it even allows us to do that with the rotation of the Earth. Modern science, for example, both Machian and Einsteinian, says that a rotating Earth in a fixed universe is one possibility. The other possibility is a rotating universe around a fixed Earth. They said it. I didn't say it. You see, so my whole game is to come back and say, well, what proof do you have that the second possibility is wrong? Why are you only teaching my 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 third grader that only possibility one is the correct? Uh, and they can't do that, you see, if they're going to be fair to science. So uh, there is, uh, I think I've answered your question there. Yeah, I think so. Bob, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I do. I, well, first of all, I think, you know, we're not, even allowing in for the third possibility. And, uh, you know, part of the flat Earth, flat earth view is that, um, you know, I guess one way we could account for what you're calling stellar parallax would be uh, layers of stars. Um, and it's kind of like, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard of an astrolabe. Okay, yeah. an astrolabe is basically a mechanical device that works, uh, you know, pretty much on the same basis as like a watch or a clock where you have several gears, you have several different cycles going on. 
several different things like that. So in, in the flat earth model, it is you know entirely plausible in my mind that we could have different layers of, of stars that are rotating at different speeds, which would give us that effect of a sterile paral uh, stellar parallax. Now, in addition to that, you, you talk about stellar aberration. And, you know, from what I can see about stellar aberration, you would have to take into account, uh, you know, the, the stars at different distances. Um, and they seem to just kind of sudden that all up. You know, for anything outside of the solar system, you have a certain degree uh, of arc seconds that you compensate for in uh, uh, stellar aberration. And it's also dependent largely on Einstein's, you know, special relativity theory. Uh, theory. So, you know, when I look at that, that is something that, that frankly, how, how can they test that? That's not something they can test. They're saying that uh, the aberration uh, is, is an effect from the distance that the light has to travel in order to reach our eye or to reach any of our instruments. But if we really are not if we really have no way to prove that, you know, what the what the arrival time is of light is going to be when it gets here, then it kind of goes into the realm of pure theoretical physics um, with no actual proof to back it up. In other words, it's a mathematical construct that is highly theoretical and really no way to actually prove it, at least not from what I've seen. Okay, well, let's deal with that. And I'll try not to get too complicated here because I, I want to keep it simple for the audience. But the fact is that every star in the sky over a period of a year is going to either make an ellipse, a circle, or a hyperbola. Uh, it's going to be a circle if you look north, if the star is at the north. It's going to be an ellipse if you look at, say, 45 degrees. So the fact is, whatever system you have, you're going to have to explain why those stars make a circle in a year's time. The heliocentrist says, well, the reason it makes a circle is because the Earth is going around the sun, and since the Earth is making a circle, uh, as we view the star from different positions that the Earth has around the sun, the star is going to appear to be in a circle because we're, lo we're looking at it from different viewpoints throughout the year as the Earth goes around the sun. The geocentrist says, well, the way we explain those uh, circles in the, of the stars is that the universe itself is making a circle around the Earth, and because it's carrying all the stars with it, well, all the stars are going to appear as little circles in the sky over the period of a year. But I haven't heard any explanation from the flat earthers how the stars are going to make a circle or an ellipse in the sky over the course of a year, and frankly, I don't see how that could be possible. Well, I think you know, I think a lot of that goes back to you know our observations of why the constellations never change year after year after year. So I mean, you can kind of look at it as a record playing over and over and over again, and uh, you know, we don't ever see any any significant change. Uh, except what we're told, you know, like uh, possibly the, that Polaris switches over to, I believe, Vega and then back because of the, uh, the uh, wobble of the Earth. But, uh, you know... Well, you're changing you, subjects on me now. We're not, we're not dealing with those two subjects. We're just dealing with stellar aberration. So how would a flat Earther explain stellar aberration? Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Stellar aberration is we're, we're disputing stellar aberration and we're saying that it's not true because it's, it's a highly theoretical and non-provable theory and construct. It's a mathematical construct that looks good on paper, but there is no way to actually to, to verify that. In other words, you can't go out to these stars that are, you know, a, a million light years or a thousand light years away and actually test that variance of, uh, you know, what angle the light would, would come in at. And as I understand sterile, stellar parallax, um, it is the idea that during the time that it takes for that light to reach from the star to the Earth, because of the position of the Earth and the entire solar system has shifted, um, that the angle that it's coming in at is actually a false angle. But again, we have no way to prove that, therefore we're disputing it you know, just on face value. So there is no explanation necessary in our model. Well, the, I know, but the fact is, if you look at those stars, they are making circles. 
So you at least have you at least have to give an explanation for the appearance of the circle. You may not believe that it's a reality, but oh, no, your we model that, has to account for the appearance of a circle in the sky. Are you talking about on a on a nightly basis? Because I thought you said yearly or what? Yeah, yearly. Uh, if you look at any star in the sky, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, let's the star um, uh, in the Milky in the the Big Dipper Betelgeuse, um, uh, it it will it will over the course of a year it will move like a clock, 360 right. degrees. Okay, and it will come back to its starting point. So why is it appearing like that to us? What motion in the sky? Is it because we we know the star doesn't move, so what is making it appear to move? Oh no, we think that it's the star that's moving. And, and why do you say the star isn't moving? Everything in the universe is supposedly moving. Well, they all move at once. The star is not moving independently. Is what I meant. Well, well they, haven't they haven't they shown that there is actually a measurement that says that they are moving? Like a distant parallax to like one star. Somebody says that it. You know, it's slightly moving every. I mean, isn't that the plan that in a hundred thousand years it'll be much different, in a much different place? You're talking about proper motion. Uh, each star has an independent proper motion. We're talking about acceleration, which is each star has the same exact radial uh, component to its circular motion. That's okay, the correct. phenomenon. Okay. Like the star so, trail photos. No, not the star trails. It has nothing to do with it. No, I'm saying that's the that's the motion you're talking about. The no, circular. It's, so it's not a star trail. Okay, no, explain to me again. Okay, stellar aberration is every star in the sky is making a circular motion over the course of a year. Okay, so the heliocentrist has its explanation. The geocentrist has his explanation. So what I'm asking for is what is the flat earther explanation? And Bob told me that there is no explanation because he doesn't believe it's a reality. But the fact is, it is a reality because that's what we see in the sky. We can measure this circular movement of all the stars in the sky. No, I'm not saying that it isn't a reality. If we can measure it, we can also see it. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that you know, in the flat Earth model, those stars are, are no more than a few thousand miles above the Earth. And therefore, if they are operating on some sort of a, like an astrolabe function where you have, when you have like layers of lights that, that are rotating around each other, um, you don't even have to account for a phenomenon that is, that is theoretical or uh, mathematical in construct. Uh, it, can be, it can be observed simply uh, under the assumption that, you know, those stars are close and they are all in their own motion. Yeah, but now you're still you're talking about stellar parallax, which is different. Okay. Well, I, I think you're correct in saying that if you have different layers of stars, that may mean that you could demonstrate stellar parallax in the flat Earth model, and I respect that. The only problem is that stellar parallax is so fine-tuned right now that the only way we could account for the difference in angles between these two stars is by having the starlight in the in the uh, range of a hundred or so light years away and not three thousand miles away you would never be able to account for the angle if your stars were only three three or four thousand miles away it just it just couldn't do it I, I don't understand how you can say that though Robert yeah, yeah. because because you know if you know think of the inner mechanism of a watch um, you have large movements, and you have um, you know little less smaller movements. The the hour hand versus the minute hand versus the second hand, and even smaller. So if if these things are local and they are they are stacked um, like that, and you are and yes, I am describing uh, more in a, of an idea of parallax. Um, but again, that's the only thing that I think we need to explain because I, I'm saying that I don't believe in stellar. Something strange in your neighborhood. Who you gonna call? If there's something.